Content warning. Check the show notes for more information. It's October 21st, 1959, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So it was today in history that one of New York's most talked about buildings, the spiral-ramped Guggenheim Museum, first flung open its doors. But neither art collector Solomon Guggenheim nor the building's designer, Frank Lloyd Wright, lived long enough to see their grand opening, Lloyd Wright having died just six months prior. But I guess when you have a 91-year-old architect at the helm, that is a risk you're taking. Well, thousands of people did turn up that day, and it's fair to say that the reaction to the building was a bit mixed. Critics panned the design overwhelmingly, likening it to, among other things, a washing machine, an inverted oatmeal bowl, and an oversized and indigestible hot cross bun. And apart from those those (laughs) critiques being quite funny and sort of accurate in their own way... One of the things that they also criticised, and I think is fairly legitimate, is that people felt that the building didn't really complement the artwork inside it. Yeah, some of the detractors argued that Wright's focus on his own artwork was to the detriment of the exhibits themselves, because the low, narrow, sloping concourses were not showing all of the paintings in their best light, particularly under natural light. There were skylights in the original design. They were quickly replaced with artificial lighting after the inaugural exhibition. And the New York Times art critic John Cannaday, who was known for having fairly conservative views. He opened his review, The Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum is a war between architecture and painting in which both come out badly maimed. If he, Frank Lloyd Wright, had deliberately designed an interior to annihilate painting as an expressive art and reduce it to an architectural accessory, he could not have done much better. (laughs) (laughs) It's just so unfair, isn't it? Because, I mean, A, it is one of the best buildings of the 20th century anyway, so... So what if it overwhelms the art inside it because it is better than the art inside it? (laughs) Um, And B, it's not as if there aren't spaces where you can have a plain white box and put some paintings on the wall. That's true. Like, that already existed. The whole point of this was to create something different. Yeah. Although, when it was first commissioned way back in the 1940s, I mean, it's amazing how long it gestated before it finally rose out of the ground. Um, There weren't that many modern art museums. There was already one in New York, but the concept behind the Guggenheim was for it to be a museum of non-objective painting, Mm. specifically. So, like Kandinsky, uh, Mondrian, that kind of thing, blocks of colours, things that aren't representative of anything. That was the founding curator and director, Hilla von Riebe's uh, vision for the thing that she pitched to Guggenheim. And I suppose then, in 1939, when they opened their very first ever gallery in a former car showroom, it would have seemed really important not to overwhelm the work because the work was cutting edge and new. Actually, by the time it opened in 1959, it was a bit passé. (laughs) Yeah, the whole story is a slow burn, because although Guggenheim's name has become associated with modern art, that interest came along really, really late. He'd been collecting art since the 1890s. He was born into this very successful mining family, and then he had lots of other successful ventures on his own, and he married a Rothschild. So he was sitting on a not inconsiderable fortune by the time he retired after World War I. He dedicated himself full-time to art collecting, but it wasn't until 1926, when he was 66 years old, that Hilla von Riebe, who you mentioned, Ollie, she had been commissioned to paint his portrait and she introduced him to abstract art, which was something that, you know, before then his collection was all old masters because that was seen as something that a wealthy, retired man might reasonably want to collect. And so at this point he began adding more avant-garde works to his collection, the likes of Picasso, Kandinsky, etc. Were those actually all portraits of him? done in an uh, unrepresentative <laughs> style. <laughs> this could be, for all we know. Yeah. <laughs> and then in 1937, he created the Guggenheim Foundation, designed to fund modern art, but also to lobby for it, because this was a time when many people, not just your ordinary stereotypical person in the street that doesn't like modern art, but you know, respected art critics were unconvinced of the merit of modernism and surrealism. Well, one of the things that Frank Lloyd Wright was unconvinced about was the chosen location for the museum. When he was asked to to uh, to take on the commission. He said, I can think of several more desirable places in the world to build this great museum, but we will have to try New York. And the compromise was that it would be right smack bang next to Central Park, which was basically a way to appease Frank Lloyd Wright's desire for the 
museum to be connected with nature, which was always a, a really critical component of Wright's design ethos. But Wright himself sounds like a total pain in the ass. Throughout the entire process, he's just being incredibly difficult and heel draggy, and then making these design decisions that weren't always marvellous. For example, he originally wanted the whole thing to be painted red on its exterior, which, as we all know, it definitely is not. It's this very sort of demure uh, grey white. Yeah, his initial vision was that it would be completely coated in red marble, and Hella von Riebe was like, yeah, our budget's probably not going to stretch to coating this entire building in marble. Let's just do concrete. And he was like, great, we'll just paint the concrete red. And she was like, no, no to all of it. It will be grey concrete. But, but I think that he just kept making these decisions that were a little bit anathema to not only the presentation of the building that the uh, that the commissioners had in mind, but also kind of the function of a gallery itself. For example, the interior walls of the rotunda are tilted outwards at 97 degrees, and Wright's idea was that he wanted them to be like a sort of painter's easel, so you could just lean works against the wall. So Convenient for stealing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, but, and actually, the tendency now is to actually hang works in a more traditional way. But so much about Wright himself is still baked into the space in a sort of inescapable way that's good insofar as he is one of the most worshipped architects of the contemporary era. But it continues to be a bit of a compromise of an experience. I think that cantankerous review by Canada is probably wrong about most of what it says but I do think that he had a point on not being able to revisit your favourite pictures That's because mm. that is something that you would think an architect would think about when it comes to form and function. When you walk around a gallery you do want, I mean I all the time have like my six year old runs away from me and then suddenly I'm in the gift shop and I want to go back to where I just come from but you couldn't do that, it was a one way experience <laughs> and if you can't just take your family to the thing you really want to see that is a failing isn't it Like you, you had to go through in a prescribed route which the architect had decided before knowing what the works were going to be that were there yeah. that's quite restrictive if you're curating the gallery I think it's so subjective as well because on one hand dispensing with this rote ritualistic layout of an art gallery as being these interconnecting rooms and changing it to something so radically different not just in terms of the shape the spiral but also the sloping so you're going in directions that you would never normally go in a gallery for some people you can see how that forces you to shake up your perspective from the beginning which is so important when you're going to see abstract art especially in an era when abstract art was you know less accepted than it is now but equally some people find it incredibly disorientating mm. to be walking on a slight incline to be sort of looking sideways at the paintings especially when they were leaning paintings against the wall lots of people just found that a really viscerally unpleasant experience but that i suppose is part of it it is supposed to be challenging and it depends whether you want to be challenged and challenging for everyone looking at the building as well i mean that's the other thing i think some people particularly art critics forget is you know they talk about a museum like that as being new york's and you know belonging somehow to new yorkers it doesn't the interior contents will not be seen by the vast majority of people <laughs> that live in that city because yeah. most people aren't interested enough in art to go to a gallery what they see is the outside of the building yeah. and having this huge concrete new structure with no deference to the architecture around it is in itself a pre-echo of the statement that you might understand if you went inside, which most people won't. So that has value in itself, doesn't it, if you believe in modern art? And I suppose there's also an opportunity that presents itself in having an unusual space in the same way that, say, the Tate Modern's Turbine Hall allows you to uh, display certain types of artworks that just couldn't exist anywhere else. And actually, one of the times that I went to the Guggenheim in New York, there was an exhibition by an artist called Matthew Barney. Such an Aryan sentence, don't you think? <laughs> one of the times I one went to the, the Guggenheim. One of the times. Okay, Jesus. well, it's, there's only been a handful. <laughs> but anyway, there was this work... What was the accompanying cocktail that you taste bad? <laughs> <laughs> well, the guy who would have appreciated an accompanying cocktail was Matthew Barney, who was the artist who was exhibiting in the space, this performance artist who did really, like, wild um, kind of uh, experiential things that were intensely expensive. But it's perfect for a space like the Guggenheim because it is odd. And so to have kind of dripping pieces of that and a big projection over there does suit it in a way that maybe just hanging traditional paintings doesn't. There was a organised attempt 
to prevent it being built by artists. There was a letter addressed to the first curator of the gallery saying that Wright's plans for a spiral walkway and the curvilinear slope, it's called, were, quote, not suitable for a sympathetic display of painting and sculpture. And that letter was signed by people like Franz Klein mm. and Philip Gustin. Mm. Yeah, Norman Mailer was another high-profile opponent. He said that it shattered the mood of the neighbourhood wantonly and barbarically. Wright himself, it's a shame that he didn't live to see it open because he was really gleeful about this prospect. He said this distinctive, massive, round shell shape amid all the blocky New York brownstones would make the nearby Metropolitan Museum of Art look like, quote, a Protestant barn. <laughs> <laughs> and so another week of retrospecting ends but next week begins a day early at club retrospectors join us now to get an exclusive episode every sunday patreon.com slash retrospectors part of the acast creator network